Um, so Stephen is the uh, Innovation Director for MBS. So Stephen has played a big part in the developments of projects such as MBS Chorus, MBS Source. Um, he was a project lead for the development of the BIM Toolkit on behalf of the UK government's BIM Task Group and the Uniclass 2015 specification system, which are major deliverable as part of the project. Um, we've also got Jeremy, um, who I think is, a, is appearing um, just now. Um, but Jeremy is uh, from J Foster Architects, who's an emerging practice delivering refined, crafted and high quality architecture with a bespoke design service. Jeremy Foster worked in, for Simpson Horn um, Architects and Eric Parry Architects prior to founding J Foster Architects in 2014. The practice has completed several projects, many of which have been published and entered to a number of architectural awards. Jeremy will talk to us about Chorus, Excel and Revit and help that, how that helps out in a professional looking specification as a set of tender documents. And um, so that's the real personal experience of using that and using those programmes that are available. Um, but I'll first of all hand over to Stephen for a short presentation. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Can you see my screen okay? It's just coming up, Stephen, now. Yes, that's perfect. Thank you. Okay, let's hope the technology technology works. <laughs> and what, what I, I will say is throughout, if anybody has any questions or observations, please pop them in the chat and we'll maybe pick, pick them up uh, at the end. Definitely. But, yeah. I'll, I'll look out for them, Stephen. And if there's any that are pressing during your presentation, I'll, I'll pass them over. Okay, and uh, yeah, hi everyone. Stephen here from Newcastle upon Tyne and the offices uh, of MBS. There's a map of uh, Newcastle from the olden days uh, behind me there. So, yeah, today we're going to talk about uh, specification writing. Uh, first of all, uh, hear a little bit uh, from myself on the importance of specification. And then I'll pass it over to uh, Jeremy Foster, who will talk about specification in practice from his experience. And then finally, we've got some sort of useful resources, uh, web links to sort of share. So first of all, I just want to look at a, a particular, unfortunate, bad example in real life, which illustrates the importance of specification. So uh, this is a project from a number of years ago in Jersey, a luxury new build house over two million pounds. And throughout the build, the client was unhappy with uh, the quality. Uh, there was no specification. I think what was written down was a, a work of a standard appropriate to the works suitable for the purposes stated in or reasonably inferred from the project documents. But without having those project documents, how can you judge the quality if the quality is not uh, specified? So a yeah, disaster of a project, the client eventually mounts action and the, there was damages against awarded against the, the designers in this situation. So I think that that's maybe a, a rare situation, but I'm sure everyone on the call has been involved in projects where there has been sort of disputes and uh, disagreements about quality as the, the sort of build has started. In this case, the building was eventually uh, demolished. Uh, where MBS started was back in the 1970s and it was set up by the Royal Institute of British Architects. Three or four architects put together to write exemplar specification clauses for projects with associated guidance and links to standards. And over that sort of 50 years, we've uh, continued to write and maintain uh, research author content, uh, which our users subscribe to. But over the years, we've adopted the latest digital technology to improve the efficiencies and the lower the risk of things going wrong on projects. Now fully online, uh, MBS Chorus platform. So we're going to have five short examples just of good specification uh, practice. Have a little look at the, the words themselves, templates and guidance. Uh, when specifying materials and products, generic or proprietary. Uh, we look at uh, developing master specifications, reusing them, coordinating the information with your drawings and schedules, uh, sort of cross-referencing and if you're using modeling tools, and then finally a little bit about information management and revisions and things. So templates and guidance, if we, this is MBS chorus on the screen at the moment, uh, but what we're going to do is look at the sort of specification clauses and the, the technical guidance that go with these. And whatever the outcomes on the project, sustainability, fire safety, accessibility, 
you've got to make sure that you specified them in the project documentation. So if you look at this uh, fictitious project and jump into the specification, then we're going to scroll down to one of the sections that's already uh, in the job. So we'll look at L10 and you may be specifying timber windows, timber roof lights. There's an example specification clause written by MBS for you to use on your projects, amend and make project specific, but in terms of the timber procurement. So really important in terms of the sustainability agenda, uh, embodied carbon, and where you're actually source sourcing your materials from. And you can choose to include all of those rows or you can cross out the rows that aren't relevant, but it's there as a starting point. So you don't have to do the research yourself because the NBS team have done that research. If you look at a, another example here, we open P12 on fire stopping systems, another really key strategic uh, thing specified in the RV plan of work is fire safety. And you see there's lots and lots of clauses referencing the latest standards on things like fire performance. And again, they, there is a base template for then you to amend and make project specific on the projects you work on. So different values depending on see where those partitions are, whether they're around the commercial kitchen or uh, around a garage in the sort of residential building or, or what have you. And the final example here, just jumping across the prelims. So smaller practices having a right to the specification deal with the contracts, contract administrator, the prelims, et cetera, uh, rules on things like substitutions. So if you specify particular products, but the tenders would like this proposed alternative products, what are the rules if that is allowed? Make sure that's written down and agree the tender time so that there's not disputes uh, further down the line. So here's clear rules in the prelims on when substituted products need to be proposed and what evidence needs to be uh, put in front of you so that you can assess the, the, the substituted product. Moving on now uh, from that sort of base content, just a little look at the difference between specifying generically or specifying proprietary products. So we look at insulation as an example here, and we're going to specify two different types of full fill cavity insulation. The first example here, we're going to specify from a proprietary brand. So you'll see in the MBS system, we have insulation from the leading insulation manufacturers with guidance on application, the technical characteristics, third party certification, et cetera. At a click of a button, you can specify a particular product from a particular leading manufacturer. And then you just need to make that project specific. So that's when you're specifying proprietary the, the other way is specifying generically, where you could maybe say, I'd like the following type of insulation to the following standard, and then you specify that minimum quality that you uh, require, it's such as I would like a, a proof of evidence of performance through a BBA or a kite mark certificate. I'd like the tenderers to submit proposals, but it must have a minimum of 80% recycled content in a certain level of uh, thermal conductivity. So throughout a uh, specification, you're probably going to have a mix of generic product specifications and uh, proprietary product specifications. All of the content that you find in MBS Chorus in terms of manufacturer specification is also available for free on MBS Source. This is what used to be the RIB product selector, but you can find uh, manufacturers, details, specific products or specific product types. So in this example here, I'm looking at access panels and I want to fill it now by uh, products that have certifier, uh, certification from a particular manufacturer. And then you can go in just like you do on Lightmove, Autotrader, Amazon, and compare the, the performance of the, or the characteristics of the products you're interested in. Chorus users can then uh, add that to the specification. Third thing I'd like to show is once you've written good specifications, using them on similar future projects. So in addition to the projects, you can create masters. This is a chorus pro feature, but inside the masters, you can, you might have a practice of four or five architects. The experts in each subject matter can maintain, and for example, here, uh, different partition uh, uh, systems. 
fill in much the same on every project, remove what you typically don't need, and then add guidance that supplements the MBS guidance on lessons learned on previous projects. So you've got that information, that knowledge at your fingertips. And when you start a new project, you can copy from the master and push that in to the new project. So you're not starting with something that's maybe 50 or 60% complete. You can really get those time savings and start with something that's maybe 90% complete and share that knowledge from the more experienced members in your practice uh, with the less experienced members in your practice. So that's come straight through to the project spec with the org notes supplementing uh, the MPS uh, guidance notes and manufacturer information. Fourth thing, just to uh, go through this list of uh, five good specification practice uh, uh, presentations, coordinated project information. So your specification isn't developing in a silo, it's developing alongside the designs that are getting put together. And we have plugins now for Vectorworks, ARCHICAD and Revit, so both PC and the Mac. Uh, and you can link the objects in the 3D model with the specification clauses in your NBS chorus uh, uh, cloud. So as you're doing your design, you can add new things to the specification. You can write the specification as you're doing your design. And you can use that 3D model almost as a sort of table of contents that takes you straight in. So you can see there I've clicked on a door in the model and I can link that to the particular door type in the specification. So that when you click on it, you see the spec. Uh, you can get a report here and say, what have I specified so far? What is still yet to specify? You can do little color codings on the left hand side if uh, that makes things easier. And actually, Chorus itself can drive Revit or ARCHICAD or Vectorworks, seeing what hasn't yet been uh, specified. It makes things like annotations and scheduling a lot easier because once the objects are linked to the specification clauses, the codes are already inside the objects. So you can see quickly what's the classification code, the wood windows which ones are type two, which ones are a type one. So again, lowering the risk of things going wrong through badly coordinated information and really getting those efficiencies on your project when you're putting together the project documentation. Those links working from the 3D model, from the drawings, from the schedules. And I think the last thing I'd like to talk about is just on the information management as you publish information from the specification. So going back to this project again, jumping to the spec, you can see a history of the, the various specifications that you've published from the MBS system. So you can see who was the one that published it, what was the suitability, what was the revision, and when they published it. And when you've published future specifications, you can compare with what's already been published. So I'm going to F30 here and I'm going to add a new clause and I'm going to revise a clause and then show how that's actually illustrated in the published output. So I've added clause six, brand new clause, and I'm gonna go down to clause, I think uh, 10 or clause eight and revise it. So I'm gonna change some of the values there in that particular clause. Now, when I send this revision out, you can publish the entire specification or you can put it in small packages. So for example, here a package just for the masonry uh, it asks, would you like to compare this with the previous specification? So yes, I'd like to compare it with the previous masonry spec. I save a copy for the future. And you can change some of that metadata. It's a new revision, maybe a new document number. It might be prepared by somebody else. And this information can appear in your document control sheet. I would probably recommend having a naming convention for the PDF or when you share it on your extranet or common data environment. And you can style it up in Chorus Pro to have your logo, have your font, so it looks exactly the same as your drawings, the same as your title sheets. So you get a very good looking specification document. You do two columns or one column, get the document control sheet, and you can clearly see now what's been revised, the clauses that have been added as new, and the clauses that have been uh, revised. And that's now a new uh, publication record against that project. So a few months time, you could come back to that project and see a history of Stephen published that specification. It was a revision to at the following date and time for the following 
uh, purpose. So what I'm going to do now is pass over to, to Jeremy Foster, director at J Foster Architects. We've not rehearsed this, so I'm going to hope the technology works. But over to you, Jeremy. <laughs> Jeremy, Jeremy, before you start, start, I've got somebody's hand up, so I just thought that might be worth, um, whilst you get your things all set up, Jeremy, would go to Stephen. Um, Adrian Waters, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question to, to Stephen? How's, how's that? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thanks, Adrian. Jolly good. Um, that's all very fascinating, but that sounds like big practice to me. I suppose, Stephen, we knew we were always going to get the questions on costs and things like that. And and I'm sure Jeremy will touch on the efficiencies that he's found in practice from it. But um, the benefit of small practice, and I suppose you've got core of small works now. I suppose, no, do you want to just touch on that? I don't have anything. I can't afford it. No, sorry, to Stephen. So sorry, oh, MBS right. have bought out of small works. Yeah, no, there, there's a small works version now as well. So I just thought Stephen could maybe touch on that um, as um, from an MBS point of view. Yeah, so yeah, we do have uh, different offers in terms of the content sets. So yes, we do have the large practice offer, which has the, the full content set, things like green walls and curtain walls and uh, things. We have content for building service engineers, structural engineers, but we have a specific content set put together for uh, smaller works. So works of a, a, a simpler nature. And that's what I was demonstrating there. And I think uh, Jeremy's going to demonstrate how that works on small projects and uh, now. So maybe pass pass to Jeremy to Yeah, that's fine. Adrian, we'll come if your question's not answered during Jeremy's presentation, I'll come back to you at the end um, so we can uh, so we can address it maybe with some of the other questions. Is that okay? Yep, fine. Okay. Brilliant. Thanks, Adrian. Right then, I'll, I'll hand over um, to Jeremy. Fab, I can see your presentation now, Jeremy. There we go. Right. So, yeah, basically, I am a micro practice. So, this is from my perspective. Um, I use a sort of BIM workflow with Revit and Chorus. So, yeah, these are kind of, you know, premium bits of software, but I basically justify and build that into kind of my fee structure with clients so uh, yeah this is just a few things I do and a sort of workflow uh, that's just a bit of background about me um, and really yeah I mean I've been operating since 2014 and have kind of refined this workflow to protect me as an architect to protect the quality of the build and protect the clients and generally to try and you know get a nice result and everyone's happy at the end and there's no awful surprises uh, cost wise uh, so just going straight into uh, the chorus screen these are just some projects which i've got set jeremy up. sorry to interrupt i can't sorry. see your present i can see the first slide of your presentation but i can't see it going going along so i don't know whether anybody else can or it's just me um but uh oh hold on sorry sorry so you can see the front cover yes i can see the front cover I can see the next slide now. Yeah. Brilliant. OK, there we go. So sorry, that's just a bit about me. Um, as I said, micro practice using this workflow uh, straight into chorus. So following on from Stephen. So <clears throat> you set up your projects uh, and you have a sort of tab for each of those. So just going into one of these, which is this project, which is going to go to tender. So what I do, I set up um, the project details, obviously. Um, and I'll do a prelims and a specification, <clears throat> which would be part of the sort of tender pack. Uh, and just going into that, you can see the contents of the prelims. These can be, you know, obviously they're written for much bigger projects, but you can just strip out anything that's kind of excessive or redundant. But it's useful to have some of that in just to manage sort of levels of quality and expectation and standards and things like that. Um, and again, with the specification, I just, yeah, just keep it sort of quite minimal, but you'll see why this is set up in this particular way. And it's again, the kind of cause um, work sections, which go in there. Uh, and just going into one particular section here. So this is L10, so the windows and roof lights. Um, and as Stephen alluded to, so the MBS source has sort of repa replaced product selector and as that becomes more fluid, it's quite well synchronized with Chorus. 
So I think it's not quite at the point, but it's almost there where you can drag and drop project uh, products and it will actually populate uh, the clauses for you for various, you know, windows or doors or, or whatever it might be. So yeah, the, on the right here, you'll see a list of these are products within Chorus, but what you can do is then go into source, uh, which is via just a web browser, and then you can add, um, add a clause and populate a clause that way. Uh, and what I, again, tend to do, and this is, you'll see this later, but you can set up hyperlinks within the specification. So this is quite useful for getting clients to sort of sign off products, because obviously for them to sort of type in something and search for it, you can just take them straight to the product page. Uh, and again, the sign off process is something that's quite kind of critical in, in my workflow. Uh, so yeah, any any sort of visual items, you know, handles, hinges, uh, trims, all, all the all the nice stuff, lights and sockets. Uh, so again, just building up a spec within Chorus, you there's a sort of code um, and colon sort of prefix you have to use to just filter by a, a works section code. Uh, and what I'll do as well is add notes. And I guess this is more useful in a, a practice where maybe you've got a few people working on a single specification, but you can sort of, um, again, things like adding client comments or to-do lists. Uh, I think this is this is one of the more advanced features actually, but that's quite a, quite a powerful feature because uh, it sort of associates it with each section or each clause. Uh, and again, just following on from um, what Stephen had shown, the outputs of Chorus are very similar. So if you're familiar with NBS building, uh, you publish a specification to um, Word or PDF file. And the feature that was uh, missing for a while but is now thankfully there is the export financial summary. And I'll go into that in more detail because that's quite key to, to, um, to how I run my projects. Uh, and this is a just a specification that's come out of the um, so a PDF of that. The template feature again, I think that's in the uh, sort of more premium chorus, but that's that's quite powerful. And again, you can get your practice logo and uh, basically tailor the the document so it matches your sort of brand brand guide. Uh, and again, just a content sheet. So this is just the specification contents I'll have. And the uh, preliminaries. And again, some, some of these you can probably strike out, you know, if it's a very small project. So the, the projects I work on are sort of between 50K and 500K, uh, but it, it sort of works pretty well for, for that range. Uh, so yeah, this is just the financial summary. So when it comes out of Chorus, you basically just get uh, two columns. So you get the codes and you get the headings, which kind of combines it with the prefixes as well. Uh, and what I tend to do is uh, format that into a sort of pricing schedule. Uh, so again, on the projects I'm working on, there is no cost consultant, so I will tender it and get it priced and manage the tender returns, uh, do like for like comparisons, and then turn this into a evaluation schedule uh, to track the cost to the end of the project. So it, it, very quickly, and depending on how detailed your um, specification is, you can get kind of line by line sections and then the sub items. Some of these are obviously just notes, they're just comments or they're just included but generally when you want a contractor to price a line item uh, I'll kind of highlight it I'll make it as easy and legible for them as I can uh, if you want to do supply and fix separately then I'll I'll double up the lines uh, and that's that's kind of the whole document there then so that's a whole pricing schedule for a project that's going out to tender um, this week um, hopefully and just from a previous project, that is what the valuation schedule looks like. So that is basically the pricing schedule, but then multiplied over, this is 20 weeks. So this was a 20 week program. Um, and again, everything at the 
bottom here was uh, sort of below below the line. So additional items and instructions which were tracked, and you can see how they kind of grow chronologically. And then the contract sum is tracked as that increases or decreases depending on what was added. Uh, so yeah, this is just um, the the project which is going to tender, and this is looking at specific uh, link to then Revit. So this is a a kitchen. So it's a number of joinery items. There's hobs and extracts and some other mechanical sort of items and a bit of lighting. So from within Revit. Um, you open a chorus browser window. So MBS have a plugin for, I think, Archicad and Revit and a few other uh, bits of BIM software. Um, you associate the object with the section and the clause and tick that, associate it. Um, and then that's done. And then that moves to the associated column here. And it will also flag up issues. If you've got kind of naming um, sort of mismatches, it will kind of highlight that. Um, again, just a different view there. So you can see the tags are starting to call out the specific MBS clauses. So as, the, as you populate um, the model and associate it clause by clause with chorus, it becomes quite a powerful thing because then you're cross-referencing that from your model and on your drawings. Um, so that is tagged there. Again, as I was saying about the prefixes, so what I tend to do is have a kind of four or five character prefix, which matches the specification with the model sort of call out. So it's just a case of making sure that they're consistent. Uh, again, electrical items. So this brings up another category here. So I've done the casework, which is the joinery and then electrical fixtures of so these are the um, the Revit categories. Um, and again, associating the joinery. So then there's a, a, a bit of blurb here, which is just about what the materials and kind of fittings are. Uh, again, this is this is fairly bespoke, but if there's something off the shelf, then you could drag that in from source. And this is what it ends up looking like once you've gone through that whole process. So you tag everything. Everything's got a clause associated with it. And there's no issues, so that's that's kind of one section done. And then what I'll do is do that for the whole project. And really, this is the whole kind of suite of tender documents. So from Chorus, you'll get a specification. I get a pricing schedule, and then the set of drawings, which is there, which are then all associated with the specification. Um, and that's really it from me. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Um, that was fascinating and great to see it actually in practice and how you're using it um, uh, with Revit. Um, I um, We've got a few questions that are coming in and I, I don't know, Jeremy, if you want to maybe um, address Adrian's question um, about using it on really small um, projects and, and, and whether it's beneficial. And maybe when you started using it, did you start using it straight away as soon as you uh, went into practice or or was it something that you decided to take on and have seen the efficiencies grow from? Um, no, I did. I mean, when I started, it was back in the days of NBS building and I, I definitely did start using it straight away. Uh, but that's kind of my background in practice and my aversion to risk and well, basically trying to protect myself. And as I say, the product and the client. So I think we all agree specifications are important. I mean, it's just up to you how you produce them. Uh, you can either get texts that are carefully researched and relate to the current industry standards, or you can sort of make it up yourself. But I definitely uh, prefer the former. Yeah, um, definitely. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think aversion to risk is quite, something that's quite inherent in architects as well, actually. Yes, um, yeah. The, um, we had a question earlier on. Well, we've had a lot about costs, Stephen. Yes. I don't know, or Jeremy, and you know, the the obviously Jeremy, you managed to factor it into your practice. Um, so I suppose, um, how how would you do that? And and then Stephen, if we just come to you and and talk about about the cost of it and 
and that as well that that would be great um because i think everybody wants to hear <laughs> about it um well as i say i have to you know it, it it definitely you know it is it is a more expensive product i think anyone who remembers mbs building was sort of priced maybe a bit more economically um but yeah i i have to just factor that in and pass on some of that to, to my clients via my fees because it's an essential for me it's an essential product uh i don't i don't believe i mean there may be alternatives out there but it's kind of the market leader so Stephen. um so yeah thank you say, <laughs> yeah, I'm so, sorry, I'm, I'm on the product development side, so I'm not really involved in the sort of setting the pricing, but I think what I say is we've got two large development teams working on chorus and source, and we've also got the content development team, which is architects, engineers, quantity surveyors that are researching the standards that come out and all day, every day, maintaining that large uh, con content set. Uh, I do have a few resources to, to sort of finish off on in terms of the slide deck. And some of these are whether you're using MBS or not. Uh, I think the, the idea of the session is more on good specification writing practices more than just th this is a particular tool. But uh, we, we do have specification writing CPD as part of the, the RIBACPD.com. And there's an article on our website that will, uh, it's like top 10 tips on writing specifications, whether you're doing them yourself in Microsoft Word or using an MBS chorus. I think this is a really good article uh, to read that's built up uh, over the years. For those of you that already do use NBS, we do have an online training platform called the NBS Academy with lots of tips and a user community and things like that as well. And for those of you that do want to know more, maybe do want a discussion over price and speak to one of uh, my, my uh, colleagues in the, the sales team, uh, the small works offering NBS Chorus Small Works is probably the most uh, relevant for emerging practices, and we can drop that uh, website uh, through. But please, uh, I think there's quite a lot of chat there. I'll go through it now and read all of the, the, the comments. Happy to sort of reach out on a Teams call or an email if we need to go into more depth. Please visit our website. This is our email if you want to ask a specific question. But uh, yeah, th thanks very much, everybody. T today, I'd, but back in your your hands, Rebecca. That's fantastic. And there is a lot of chat, but actually that's what today's all about. It's all about knowledge sharing, people hit, listening and learning from, you know, the people that are attending as well as the people that are speaking. So that's absolutely fantastic. And, you know, it's great to hear how many people are using Revit, Vectorworks, AutoCAD, and obviously your programme, Stephen, plugs into all those things. So, you know, it's still relevant to, to everybody here. Um, I think we had a question earlier on about it, um, referencing within the MBS different um, British standards. And, and obviously then they're behind a paywall as well. But I suppose um, as architects, you were saying, Jeremy, about being risk averse, we need to be designing to those British standards anyway, whether we're referencing them in the specification or not. So they're still relevant, whether they're behind a paywall in MBS or they need to be bought by you as an architect. Um, Jeremy, do you go through and do you read all those BS, the, the BS <laughs> 300 and everything that it references to? Um, or do you just have them and have to design to them as an architect anyway? Uh, I mean, I have done in the past. But I don't actually <laughs> read every BS as it's uh, revised, but maybe I should. Um, no, I mean, it's, it is just being aware, yeah, if, you know, if there is a product or a particular process, just being aware what the current standard is uh, and, you know, what responsibilities you as a designer have and just making sure you've got the expertise, the knowledge and the experience uh, with whoever is delivering that particular if it's a specialist subcontractor section. Definitely. And yeah, I know I it's I just... a thrilling night in reading all these uh, British standards, but uh, sometimes I suppose we have to keep <laughs> up to date with these things. <laughs> I think it's not just about citing the standard, but it's obviously the, the level in the standard as well, whether you're after a certain acoustic performance or durability or fire performance. It's not as simple as saying just 2BS1234. It's grade two within this or acoustic grade three. And sure. I think manufacturers, most of the large manufacturers have really good technical teams that will help guide you as well because they want to be specified. So looking through the content and MBS source has some great contacts that you can get free advice off the, the manufacturers as well. 
Well, so, sorry, I was just going to add the, so obviously with the level of specification and the projects I'm on, it's, you know, it's whether with a bigger project, you might have, um, it'll be performance specs or it'll be prescriptive or descriptive. So there are kind of different levels of specification anyway. So it's, uh, again, what you're echoing, what Stephen says, you're either going to the nth degree and specifying the nails and the spacing and the actual material thickness, or you're just saying it is just a gas housing box or a window that opens. Um, so yeah, it's just, yeah, making sure the level, level of specification you're going into as well. Yeah, and, and that's appropriate to the scheme and the fees that you've put forward and to what the, the client's asking for as well. I think that comes into account a lot when it taking on and, and, and putting those things um, together on, on each individual job because they, they are so different um, when, when we do that. Um, Michael, you've got your hand up. I don't know whether you want to um, unmute yourself and, and ask a question. So my question was to Jeremy, uh, very impressive specification there and schedules of costs and everything. Uh, that must be very time consuming, you know, you know so your fees must be, uh, you know, quite, quite high to cover that time. Hmm. But, uh, in terms of the cost schedules, I don't know where you find your pricing from to actually do that. I mean, and do builders understand it? Can they work to that to actually, you know, price a job? Uh, well, I, I don't put the prices in. Yeah, they populate that. Um, but I, I just give them a column. I mean, it's sort of based on... I think it was a it was a template from probably Specman way back when. So uh, yeah, it's just a rate, you know, whether okay. it's linear meter or area cost. Okay, <laughs> that's what you'd actually price the job. Yeah, no, it's just it's literally quantities and rates. That's all it is. Right. I mean, yeah. And what I'll do, I mean, on projects, you know, if it is uh, if they're particularly struggling, I can sometimes, although I'm, I don't always offer it up, is offer up some of the. Um, uh, quantities, you know, because that's coming out of the, the BIM model as well. Um, okay, that's great. Yeah, thanks for that uh, reply. That's great, Jeremy. And I suppose it, it provides all of the people that are tendering with the same template in order to then submit back. So you've got a real, you know, evaluation of costs is all based on the same same format well, as well. Yeah, the I, the ideal is to get the like for like comparison, but they don't always follow the template. <laughs> no, Sometimes they'll have their own in-house template, which does it back to front. And anyway, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh dear. Uh, right, well, we've only got a couple of minutes left in this session um, and just uh, there's quite a lot of um, chat going on about um, uh, pricing and costs and different costs that have been put on. I'd really, really encourage you to get in touch with MBS if you're interested or, or want some information on it and to look at that um, writing a specification um, link that, has, that Stephen put up because that is really, really interesting um, and it's got some really good points in there for everybody as well. Um, I think I think we've covered most of the questions because I think everything else um, has put in. But I suppose, Joe, I mean, Stephen, it'd be really good for you to have a look at this and maybe take back to MBS. Some of the comments have been made because it's great to hear, you know, maybe whether there's a range of options, monthly costs, cost per annum, different service levels, people that have used MBS building and things that they liked about that. Um, so we can we can put some of those together for you um, as some great feedback uh, for MBS as well. Um, I think uh, that is about everything from everybody. Um, I will now hand over, oh, sorry, we've got one. Um, I wanted to ask you if we'll be able to watch the recordings back afterwards. Yes, it will be recorded afterwards. Um, um, each session.